Hi everyone, welcome to the Equestrian Queensland webinar on rider full safety. Um, I'll hand over to Lindsay Nyland in a moment. On the right hand side of your screen you'll see that there is a window. You can type any questions that you've got throughout the webinar in there and I'll ask those questions to Lindsay. So enjoy. Okay, thanks Christine and uh, welcome everyone to the uh, presentation on Rider Fall Safety. Um, the topic I'll be talking about tonight, Rider Fall Safety, is a very important topic for horse riders as I'm sure everyone will appreciate. Um, so uh, uh, you can certainly see from my background that I have a background in uh, gymnastics. Um, I've only ridden horses recreationally so certainly um, I'm not an expert when it comes to riding skills and practices, but um, as you can see on that uh, first slide in front of you there, a uh, picture of a gymnast coming off a pommel horse, well, uh, that's the sort of thing I did many, many times over in my career. So uh, certainly, uh, hopefully you can see that there's some relationship there between uh, uh, the skills and, and that I'll be talking to you about tonight, um, and importantly, how we can apply those in a horse riding equestrian environment. You can also see up the top of the uh, opening slide there, uh, of course, a bit of historical perspective. Um, so uh, gymnastics and horse riding, in fact, have uh, or do share some common history, even going back to the uh, Roman times and uh, the Macedonians who used wooden horses to train their soldiers and army. So um, you can see from the picture on the screen there that the evolution of the pommel horse has come about uh, you know, uh, over, over years uh, being used in a horse riding context. So, um, so that's interesting. Uh, and a famous, or uh, well, not famous, but a, a, a well-known quote there from a Mexican proverb, it's not enough to know how to ride, you must know how to fall. So um, I hope you enjoy the presentation and please feel free to uh, ask questions as we go. So the first thing, just to kick off, uh, again, on the uh, gymnastics theme, but this uh, story, which is a true story, does have uh, an important analogy to the topic tonight. Uh, and that is uh, going back some years when I was coaching um, a junior women's elite squad in WA. I'm from uh, Perth originally. And I was coaching a, a, a young a women's squad for the high performance stream of gymnastics. Uh, and one of the top young gymnasts I was coaching by the name of Kerry, uh, was practicing a skill on the balance beam. It's a, it was a backflip on the balance beam. Uh, for those of you that uh, may know something about gymnastics, the balance beam is 10 centimetres wide, so it requires a lot of skill to do um, that type of uh, exercise on the balance, uh, balance beam. And what happened in this uh, particular situation, it was about three weeks before the Junior National Championships and Kerry was actually uh, a very talented young gymnast and she was uh, a medal contender uh, for that competition. So we were certainly uh, training very hard at that time. And all of a sudden, Kerry uh, stopped when it came to performing the backflip on the balance beam uh, quite unexpectedly. And um, so that was a bit... Uh, perplexing um, and I said to Kerry well what's wrong you know tell me about it um, she said no nothing's wrong so we uh, did what we often did when when uh, sometimes the skill gets uh, lost after it's learned and we went back to the basics and we went through the basic uh, progressions again uh, and uh, gradually worked it back up to the high beam and lo and behold when she got to the back foot again she stopped so this went on for uh, a number of days, and after a few days, um, of course, uh, Kerry knew very well that this was a compulsory skill for her division in the national championships. Um, and it's at, at that point, uh, the realisation, of course, that the national title would be totally out of her reach without the skill that, you know, she got upset, uh, started to cry, which, you know, understandably, uh, with the goal that uh, a 10-year-old uh, would be very disappointed. So uh, at least at that point, we managed to sit down and talk about it. And so Kerry uh, courageously uh, confessed and said, look, I had a bad dream uh, a few nights ago. And that dream, which really I guess we describe as a nightmare, was that 
um, she was doing a backflip on the beam and missed her hands and hit her head on the beam. And it was a very vivid dream. And of course, that's what had got her spooked about doing the backflip. So, um, so at least now talking about this, uh, we're able to uh, decide what we're going to do about it. So, um, we again discussed the, uh, the, the, the issue at a conscious level. Conscious level being, look, um, a bad dream, that can happen. Uh, let's not worry about it. It uh, uh, can happen to anyone. And as we know, um, sometimes our mind can play tricks on us and uh, put us off in these situations. So we tried to consciously overcome that demon image that was coming into her mind while she was doing the backflip. And uh, uh, unfortunately, that didn't seem to help, even though she certainly agreed with everything we were talking about that no it's only a dream and you know dreams uh, uh, don't don't necessarily come true uh, it was such a vivid uh, image in her mind that um, it really did uh, spook her in terms of uh, this skill so um, we had to change strategy and the strategy um, that I, I put to her I said look it doesn't appear that we're going to get rid of this uh, this image in the short run anyway. It was a very strong image. Uh, she agreed that it, you know she could do the backflip. She's done it hundreds of times in the past. She was very competent at doing that skill. Um, but this image kept popping into her mind. So the strategy we talked about was, look, what we're going to do is allow that image to come into her mind. We're not going to try and fight it. We're going to face it head on. So to face it head on, what we said is, look, um, it's there, uh, it's not real, but um, it's somehow filtered its way into her, her, uh, uh, her mind. So we're going to allow that image to come in and still then jump backwards and go into the movement sequence uh, as she planned to do. So she thought that was pretty funny at the time, thinking, why would I want to think about something as traumatic as that? <laughs> the fact of the matter was, that was there and we weren't going to get rid of it. So I said, look, well, I'll spot you. In other words, you'll do the skill with assistance. So there's not going to be any risk if something goes wrong. And we allowed that to happen. And lo and behold, um, what we'd actually done is change something that was unexpected to being expected. So uh, in doing so, she then was able to perform the backflip because she was ready for it. She was confronting that image head on uh, and expecting it and knowing it really wasn't going to stop her from performing the skill. Uh, so after a few goes and practice with me helping, um, she managed to uh, overcome that fear uh, and face that demon image, right? And lo and behold, she uh, got past that and, and uh, interestingly, within a, a short period of time, had forgotten about it altogether because obviously the positive focus on the movement sequence then was able to override it. Essentially, what we're doing is allowing her subconscious mind to perform the skill as she'd performed it many times before. So she went on three weeks' time. Uh, she won the national junior national championships and was selected uh, as a member of the uh, elite squad. So it's a great outcome. But I just wanted to tell that story because I think the subject matter that we're talking about tonight, I understand is not necessarily the sort of thing that uh, riders or uh, jockeys or um, equestrian uh, riders want to necessarily talk about. But I think it's very important we talk about it because uh, if we don't, we could find ourselves in a situation in an emergency where we go into a, what's called a brain freeze because you know we haven't had the practice in, in order to know what to do when that situation arises. So, um, yeah, that was, I thought, just a, a relevant uh, story there. So um, we'll just uh, head through now, just click to the next slide. Um, Um, I'll go past the slide. If obviously, my background experience you can see there, and uh, now that's for reference, so there's no need for me to talk about that. Um, so, agenda for this evening is um, we're firstly going to talk about fall and response times. Uh, I often hear um, people say, look, no time to respond in a fall incident, it all happens in an instant. Uh, and I certainly understand and acknowledge why people uh, might feel that way about falling off their horse. It is certainly quick. There's no question about that. Uh, but the good news is, the good news is that's within the realm of our capability to do something in that time, providing we've been trained. But we are going to look at the fall and response times because I think that's pretty important uh, so we can, I guess, uh, uncover any 
um, misunderstanding that there might be about that. So we'll look at that first. Emergency response action. Okay, so um, I won't talk a lot about it now, but it's a very important thing that uh, riders need to be trained in, in what to do in that instant that they realise they're falling. All right, and it's a particular emergency response action that I've designed that is applicable for all horse riding fall incidents, which riders can be trained in. Uh, then we're going to look at some fall safety skills so you get a feel for what fall safety training is about um, uh, in going through a number of training sessions. I mean, I've certainly reports from riders that have um, been through an introductory training session have been very positive, and that's great to hear. But I'm recommending that uh, riders do, uh, say, around 10 training sessions to develop a, a wide range of skills to support them in a number of scenarios. So we'll be looking at some videos. I won't be showing any videos of riders falling off and getting hurt, so uh, don't be concerned about that. Um, but there will be some video videos of gymnasts coming off as well. Uh, none of those are the, uh, videos of people getting hurt too, uh, just to demonstrate the importance of some of the techniques. Uh, we're going to look specifically at tumbling at speed and also uh, the rotational fall that I think um, uh, is one that has a very high risk of serious injury. So uh, that's important to be able to know that there's something we can do in those situations. And the training required, so obviously in the end you might want to know a little bit more about, well, uh, what sort of training's required, how much and how often and so forth. Um, so I will say, of course, that, look, this uh, is a fairly new safety initiative. I've been working on it for some time now, but uh, still new in terms of being done on a systematic basis for horse riders. Um, and I'm not suggesting that any this or any safety measure can prevent all the injuries from happening. I think everyone would, would understand that. Uh, but certainly um, it is one more measure or one thing that can be done to assist in minimising the risk. So that's what we're talking about is minimising the risk. A little quote there by a very famous author, Malcolm Gladwell. Um, he wrote a book oh, some years ago called Blink. Uh, and that was a book called Blink the Power of Thinking Without Thinking and he examines in that book the experiences of a number of people in different fields of endeavour where unconscious or subconscious reactions are absolutely critical uh, in sometimes life or death situations. So he's looked at that very carefully and his conclusion from uh, um, speaking with a lot of people about the subject matter of unconscious reactions was that spontaneity isn't random. How good people's decisions are under the fast moving, high stress condition of rapid cognition is a function of training and rules and rehearsal. So certainly um, he, uh, he uncovered some very good uh, research and analysis on the fact that people can be trained to uh, respond very, very quickly uh, in certain situations. So that's our agenda. Uh, so moving through to the first, um, first important item, and that is the item about fall time. So when we're talking about time, obviously we know it's a very short amount of time from when a rider um, recognises that they're falling to the point where they impact the ground. So we're going to talk about it in milliseconds with um, one second is a thousand milliseconds. So, you know, if we're for argument's sake, talking about a half a second, that'd be 500 milliseconds. So uh, it's important we talk in those terms because the research around um, reaction times is all like in, in, in that term. So one thing we do know, uh, and this is obviously based on well-accepted science, so uh, you know, no uh, uh, conjecture here, and that is fall time to the ground is a function of height of the fall. Uh, of course, uh, when we introduce a horse variable, that does change things a little bit. But uh, simply, if we look at a free fall time from someone falling from, for argument's sake, 1.5 metres, it's just over half a second or 553 milliseconds. Now, sitting on a horse, of course, you know, average horse height may be 1.6 metres, but then the rider's up uh, some 40 or so centimetres above that with terms of centre of gravity. So literally, you know, height of fall from an average horse height is going to be approximately two metres. So that means just the free fall time, meaning, you know, if we uh, suddenly find ourselves in the air falling to the ground, is going to be 630 or so milliseconds, which is just over half a second. So that's pretty quick. Two and a half metres. Now, obviously, uh, not all falls are the same. There are very many different scenarios that occur. Um, so it could be that, you know, particularly in a jumps uh, uh, event where 
obviously we're, we're going up um, and or possibly a rider might get butted into the air for argument's sake. They could certainly be coming down from a higher height. So, you know, that on one hand is good because we've got a bit more time. On the other hand, uh, as we know, it means that we might, we're, we're likely to impact the ground in a, in a heavier fashion. Um, now, one thing I did do is had, have, have had a look at a lot of videos now and analysed a lot of fall incidents because obviously it's very important uh, that any training that riders do is fit for purpose um, and so it's pretty important that uh, there's an understanding of what happens in a fall incident. So having looked at a large number of videos, I've just put a, a, a reasonably representative sample, I think, up there of fall times uh, for you to look at. So jockey fall times, um, what we can see there is um, a range from around about half a second, which would mean uh, obviously the riders coming off from um, from a lower height, but also uh, probably not impacting their horse before they hit the ground. In other words, it's a free fall from quite a low height um, and you know, often traveling at speed, of course. So that's half a second, that's pretty quick. Uh, on other occasions, you know, as a rider's falling, they might impact their horse in some way um, and that slows down or breaks their fall a little bit uh, before they hit the ground and that can lead to an increased fall time, such as jockey one on that list, one second. Looking at the show jumping cross-country fall times, obviously uh, in a jump situation, the rider's travelling up. So quite often, you know, they, they can become unseated, you know, midway through a fall, not necessarily just when they hit the ground. Um, and also because uh, I guess uh, the other uh, uh, observation I'd say about looking at the show jumping cross-country falls as opposed to, you know, the jockeys that are travelling at a faster speed is because of the slightly reduced speed, more often than not I've seen in those videos that the rider impacts their horse in some way as they're falling or is more likely to impact the horse. Not not always, as you can see on the uh, slide there, right at 10, you know, just over half a second, which, which really indicates they haven't impacted their horse, it's just a free fall. Um, so what we've seen with, this, with the jumps activities is still some incidents that happen very quickly, uh, just over half a second with ones that take slightly more than a second. So whichever way we look at this, you know, we'd have to say that's quick. Uh, and if we say, well, let's just look at the average for argument's sake, well, we've got an average of around about three quarters of a second or slightly above that in the jumps events. So on, what we do know from this is on average, it's about three quarters of a second, ranging from a half a second to about a second to respond in a fall incident. So look quick, uh, but the good news, as we'll see in a minute, um, there is time to do something, providing we've had some training. Now, I'll just say one more thing about this before I move on. Uh, an interesting little scenario, and that is um, you might... One might be uh, tempted to think, well, obviously in the fall um, scenarios where there's less time, a rider's perhaps, you know, less likely to be able to respond properly and possibly more likely to get badly injured than when they've got more, more fall time. But um, I can't answer that question, question statistically because I don't think my sample size is big enough. But I have seen cases, and you know, one classic case is what you can see in front of you here, that case of uh, a half a second was actually, um, and I've spoken to the jockey and he's happy for me to uh, mention his name, it's Peter Hutchinson, or Hutchie as he's, as he's known, he's a retired jockey now, and that was a fall in the 1992 Cox Plate. So I just want to show you a picture of that. Unfortunately, he doesn't get badly hurt. So as I said, I'm not going to show you any anything that uh, uh, is catastrophic. Um, so I'm just going to flip across. Uh, where are we here? And you'll be able to see the, a picture of this. It's not a video. It's simply just a picture of the instant just before Hutchie uh, impacts the ground. All right. So there it is. Um, all right, so I'm only going to play it. Oops, so we're going to stop there. Um, right, and we're just going to go back to our presentation. Sorry, I'm a bit of a novice at this. So as you can see, in that situation, Hutchie had half a second. Now, everyone knows that's very quick. Fortunately, um, Hutchie had taught himself, well, one way or another, uh, he responded intuitively to let go of the reins and brace himself. That's let go and put the arms into that brace position, which you saw on the video there. He just got his hands off the reins, 
before uh, the impact with the ground, uh, and he managed to get himself into a roll sequence. So that horse was coming down at obviously a very, very fast pace, uh, and as you can see also, he had a pack of horses following him. So Hachi has managed to let go of the reins in that time, uh, consciously, unconsciously, whatever the case might be, and get himself into a tuck position so he can roll. Now, unfortunately, obviously leading that race or being in front, he then did get trampled, but he was in the tuck position, which is the best possible position for him to be in in that situation. Uh, so he ended up with uh, a broken ankle, a black eye, and a torn ligament in his knee. Now, I know they're not very nice injuries, but when you think of the possible consequences uh, of a fall such as that, I think, you know, he's, he's maximised his chances of getting out of that uh, without serious injury, which, which is what happened. And conversely, and I will say, um, one of those um, jockeys there that was in the one second, unfortunately, uh, did hang on to the reins and one of those was a catastrophic injury. So look, um, it doesn't necessarily mean just because it's quick, there's no time to respond. Um, there is time in those time frames to do some response action. Okay, so when we talk about fall time, uh, we know what the fall time is. We know it's roughly three quarters of a second, sometimes a bit less. So how much time does it take to respond? What's, the, what's our capability in that regard? So we need to look at this or break it down into two fundamental components. The first one is reaction time. So that's simply our ability or our, our ability for us to recognise that we're in trouble. Um, and that's the best way of looking at this is, say, simple reaction time. That's been very well researched over the years and studied by many people. Um, and you can see some studies in that slide there that have been done for various people. And what you can see over on the um, right-hand side there um, is the milliseconds. So in these studies, uh, we're seeing simple reaction times of, you know, from about 100 and 30 odd milliseconds to just over 200 or 220 in this case. So that's around two tenths of a second, all right? So simply what we mean by simple reaction time is our brain's ability to recognise some type of stimulus. Now, it would be no different, say, if you accidentally put your hand on a hot plate or something like that when you weren't expecting it to be hot. Uh, it would take, you know, about 150 or so milliseconds or 200 for you to realise that, ouch, that's bad, and, you, of course, you, your reaction would be to take your hand off the stove. Or it could be, uh, and I've given a good example there, we won't do this now because obviously this is not an interactive session, but you might be interested in testing your own, your own reactions. You can do it with a very simple thing like a ruler drop test. So that would simply be holding onto a ruler with the zero centimetre mark uh, on your finger. You need a partner for this, of course. You can't do it with one person. Um, so one person releases the ruler and the next person has to catch it once they see the ruler is falling. Um, so that's a simple reaction time test. And, you know, you can work out your simple reaction times by how many centimetres the ruler drops before you catch it. So um, what we do know from those type of tests or experiments is that average adult reaction time is around about 200 milliseconds, all right? And that, you know, ranges, obviously not everyone's the same, uh, but it's usually in a range of about 130 or 40 milliseconds up to just over 200 milliseconds. Now, some people ask the question, well, you know, what about um, children? So certainly... Um, children have slower reaction times because their brain is still developing. But usually about mid-teens mid to late-teens, um, uh, it, it pretty much gets to a point where it's uh, similar, if not the same, as an adult reaction time. So once, you know, our brain's fully developed. So in the, in the sort of late-teens to uh, 20 to 30 years of age, that's probably when our uh, reaction times are their fastest. But interestingly... They don't taper off much. They stay fairly constant, according to the research, till about age 50, and then there's usually a bit of a, a decline after that. But it's not a marked decline. I mean, once we get into retirement and obviously as we age, you know, reactions slow after that. So for, for most adults, and certainly this would apply to anyone that's engaged in writing activity, we know that on average reaction time is going to be about 200 milliseconds. All right, and that's simple reaction time. So that's obviously when we're expecting the need to react. And I'm going to talk about an unexpected situation more in a minute. 
So, all right, so that is 200 milliseconds. Now, that's just, of course, really our brain's ability to recognise. It doesn't include movement time other than that very small movement we might talk about with either clicking a mouse button or uh, grabbing a ruler, which has only got a very small amount of movement. So, really, if we're doing something to protect ourselves in a fall incident, we have to add on top of that the movement, the time it takes to move our arms and, and body into a different shape for argument's sake. So we're going to look at now the movement time uh, and the emergency response action. So in this slide, um, the first thing we'll look at is the um, – well, first I'll just cover the, the basic emergency response action that riders are being taught. Uh, now, the good thing about this emergency response action is it's a response action that applies to all fall incidents, at least the initial part anyway. And there's a reason for that because uh, we'll talk about this a bit more in a, in a minute. And that is if we start to introduce choices into the equation or evaluation of what's going on around us, we suddenly get to a point where we're going to run out of time. So knowing we've got to prepare for the worst case scenario being potentially half a second, uh, there needs to be something that riders can be taught to do in that half a second to protect themselves. So it's the brace position. All right, and it's letting go of the reins because we can't put our arms into the brace position while we're hanging on to the reins, all right? We need to be in control of our own body shape and position. That's why letting go of the reins is so important. Um, and also, on, we'll talk, actually talk more about letting go of the reins in another slide. So the emergency response action is to let go of the reins and to snap the arms quickly into a brace position, which is arms above the head, you know, not fully above the head, not forwards, about halfway between, and a nice strong arm tension. And as you can see from my hands, turn in slightly. All right, that's the brace position. Um, and having measured that, um, and I'll just show you now on the video of uh, the demonstrator is my 15-year-old son, Riley, you'll be pleased to know. Um, so I'll just show you a, a video of the um, brace position. Um, and Riley's performing this, by the way, within a quarter of a second. So on the reins, and it's a little drill. If it gets going, Christine, is that playing on yours? No, okay, I've clicked on play. Let me just stop it and try and start it again. So I'm not sure we seem to have a, a freeze here. Do I need to go back to the start of the... No, it's... Um... Mm. Okay, um, Christine, I'm not sure what... Close it. We're just stuck on that screen there and it doesn't seem to be... It's showing that it's playing, but it's actually not playing. So close, and close and reopen. Okay, so I'll just close and reopen and see how we go. Okay. Go back to here. Sorry, folks, we should get this fixed in a second. Okay. Right here, ho. Oh, all right, okay. It looks like we're going to see Hutchie's uh, famous fall position, but you can see there how he's got his arms up above his head. Now we'll watch Riley do the simulation. So, see, just a quick let go of the reins, arms into brace position. All right. Um, so, hopefully, we'll work okay there. Now, back to the presentation. So hopefully that gives everyone an understanding. Look, it's a very simple drill and it's a very simple exercise and we do that in a number of different ways to um, really practice. It's important that riders practice letting go of the reins because it's not intuitive for riders necessarily to do that. So one thing I can tell you with certainty is that movement time, as you can see on the right-hand side of that slide, is 250 milliseconds plus or minus a few milliseconds. So um, getting the arms off the reins into that position can be done very quickly. Um, 
So the emergency response action is obviously firstly to recognise that uh, one is falling uh, and there's a point of no return. I certainly do understand that uh, sometimes the rider might become unbalanced or a horse might stumble and recover itself. Look, nothing changes in relation to this training about riding skills and practices. Uh, the first thing uh, every rider is going to want to do is to recover a situation if they're off balance or their horse is stumbling and they can possibly help the horse to recover. Uh, this emergency response action is there for the point at which you realise that there's no way out of it, you're flying through the air um, and you're going to impact the ground. So it's that point of realisation that it's let go of the reins and brace and that can be performed within a half a second. So I'll put down, see I'll put 250 milliseconds for reaction time, but I've allowed a bit of a safety margin there. A lot of people would react quicker than that, but you know I want to be somewhat conservative about my assumptions here. And the 250 for the brace position, which equals the half a second emergency response action. So in summary, in relation to emergency response action, um, look, there's no time for conscious analysis and evaluation. So I think when people say, look, I didn't have time to respond, uh, I understand probably what is uh, their meaning in that situation. I wasn't able to figure out what was happening uh, with me or my horse or which way I was falling. Uh, and of course, if we introduce that conscious decision making to be able to evaluate, well, uh, if you add choice reaction time into that, it adds many, many more milliseconds onto that time frame. Um, but there is time for trained response action. Um, response action can be quick once it's trained, and certainly the speed of response in an emergency will improve with training. So that's the emergency response action. Um, now we're going to go to the slide on expectancy. All right, so certainly the first thing that people might be thinking is, well, all that's all very well, but we don't always know that um, before it happens that we're going to fall, it can, we can be caught off guard, and that's certainly, I understand the case. Sometimes, fortunately, riders do have a warning signal. So that could be, uh, again, a foot coming out of the stirrup. It could be the fact that you know, in a jump, a horse is taken off poorly and you realise, oh, this is not looking good, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a fall straight away. Uh, but it can alert the rider to the fact that they could be in trouble. So if there is some warning signal, uh, then it means our focus of attention, uh, we can be ready to react um, if the inevitable does happen and we start flying through the air. But occasionally, of course, it, it can happen uh, with very little warning. Uh, this guy, uh, Bertelson, did some research about that in 1967, and he found that um, when there was a warning signal of only as little as one to 200 milliseconds, reaction time is quicker because that was simply the mental processing time. So I think uh, in an unexpected fall incident, and I think there was a, a presentation a, a month or so ago by um, a very good sports psychologist who talked about uh, focus of attention in that presentation about obviously important um, when you're in high performance sport or riding that you're focusing your attention uh, on what you're doing. And it was a, a simple focus of attention, which uh, certainly all of that makes perfect sense. Uh, so you know, if you are focusing, of course, on the riding activity or the jump or whatever it is you happen to be doing, um, it needs time if we're falling for our, our ability to switch our focus attention from that to something else. So that's again a mental processing time. So if we allow another 200 milliseconds for that, just that time to recognise when our mind might be focusing on something different uh, to switch focus of attention. But of course, if we haven't been trained, well, that we've got nothing to switch our focus of attention to and that's where we could end up freezing, which is not, not a good thing. So um, we're allowing in this whole uh, equation, I guess, another uh, 200 milliseconds if it's an unexpected fall incident, but that's not a simple uh, one size fits all. There's going to be some very different scenarios that occur. Sometimes there might be a little bit of warning. Sometimes there might be no warning. Sometimes there might be a lot of warning. So when we look at all of that, what we can see on this graph here, which this graph explains it, is look, um, there's going to be a range of where 
our ability to respond in a fall incident is, um, I guess, very low. And that would be if things happen, you know, in 400 milliseconds, it would mean we hardly even have time to do an emergency response action in that situation. Um, but once we have some warning signal, as we can see, the reaction time is more likely to be closer to the simple reaction time, and then we can do our emergency response action in that half a second. So this graph simply says, look, there's going to be a grey area in between there where uh, we may well be able to uh, respond or we may find ourselves only be, being able to partially respond or not respond to a point where with training, most riders should be able to respond to protect themselves. So, you know, that's what that graph's all about. So that simply says, well, you know, obviously, um, you know, if, if the fall is a half a second, you know, this could be uh, difficult in an unexpected fall incident. But as you saw from the picture of Hutchie, he managed to respond in half a second and obviously he had very quick reactions. So what this indicates is that um, there certainly is a uh, great benefit in doing training because most fall incidents are more than half a second, um, certainly uh, the vast majority, and on average uh, around three quarters of a second we can see that uh, training in fall safety skills is likely to be significantly beneficial to riders on a large number of fall incidents. So you know, I just wanted to make sure that point was clear about uh, response times, uh, but given the, the fall times are so quick, uh, we can't expect people to um, respond without some training. Um, I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, no, actually, I'll move on because I think we can cover that on the next slide. So hanging on to the reins, we've talked about that, and I think um, most riders that I speak to now probably recognise the fact that hanging on to the reins in a fall incident is not a good idea. Uh, the problem, of course, is that it's not necessarily intuitive for riders to let go of the reins, as you can see in, in these uh, photos, which come from the British Medical Equestrian Association. Those two bullet points also come from their website too, by the way. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, um, as they've indicated, no, these falls didn't result in uh, any serious injury. Um, but nevertheless, I think you can clearly see from that that the potential for serious injury is very, very high. The rider on the left-hand side who's hanging on, uh, it looks like the reins are becoming taut, so probably she'll flip over and land hopefully on her seat or something like that when she impacts the ground. Uh, but I can think, think everyone can understand if that horse was falling at the same time, she may find herself in a, a, a terrible situation where it's a head first impact and a horse landing on top of her. So clearly um, letting go of the reins is the odds on um, lower risk response action in a fall incident, and particularly when we're talking about putting the arms into the brace position to protect the head and neck. Uh, and the slide on the right obviously uh, shows, of course, how uh, hanging on to the reins uh, in that situation can lead to trample injury. Uh, but the most important thing to understand from this is that um, it does require some training. Now, some riders or a lot of riders have taught themselves skills such as that, or perhaps someone else has taught them, uh, and that's a good thing. So we're going to look at a couple of videos now, um, a show jumping one. Unfortunately, the quality is not very good because it's uh, off the internet, so I apologise for that. Uh, and a jump jockey um, who clearly are um, executing very specific uh, response action to let go of the reins, which is the correct thing to do. So I think it's good to see, you know, the right response action in these situations and no one's getting hurt. Um, so I'll just flip across and hope our video plays for us. So um, the first one is the show jumping one. So you can see there it's very quick and you'll see it a bit slower on the second video. So sorry, it's a bit blurry. And as you can see, lands in a, what's called a four point landing. This one going at speed, you see the jockey gets his arms up very quickly and you'll see this one more time, just a good measure. Uh, arms up, let go of the reins and he lands on his knees and goes into a roll. So he's okay out of that, whoops, sorry. Um, now I just wanna make a couple of points about that. So you can see there, those riders have uh, clearly um, clearly um, 
taught themselves the correct emergency response action to let go. And you can see it's a very uh, conscious decision to let go of the rain. So one thing I will say um, is um, some riders might be concerned about, well, hang on, if I do this for safety training, isn't it going to program my brain that I'm going to fall off my horse more often? No, that's not the case because clearly, uh, you know, no more would you want to fall off your horse than would you want to open the door and jump out of a moving car. It's just not something that uh, people are going to do uh, unconsciously. The initial response action in an emergency still has to be a single conscious decision to let go of the reins and put the arms in brace position. That's a conscious decision that has to be made. But it's a single conscious decision and it doesn't require deliberation. It doesn't require the rider to go, well, you know, am I falling this way? Am I falling that way is my horse falling which way am I going to land none of that is necessary it's just let go and arms up and I think you can even see with those two riders particularly the jumps jockey he let go of the reins before his feet were even out of the stirrups right and I think there's an important message there and obviously jumps jockeys they come off quite often because uh, of the nature of the activity they're involved in um, and they're at a much higher risk of crush injury because of the fact that horses can trip as they come over the obstacle, which is very similar to the, uh, obviously the difficulty that uh, equestrian riders have in show jumping and cross country. So the important thing uh, is to let go because even if for some reason the feet didn't come out of the stirrups, um, you know, the last thing you want to be doing is hanging onto the reins still attached to the horse. With a bit of luck, with the motion and forces involved, your feet hopefully would get pulled out one way or another, but it's still the uh, better response action. So, um, right, that's uh, moving on. Christina, we, um, any questions? Or, no, no, okay, keep going. Good. I'm oh, certainly um, happy to take questions at the end too. So the next thing we'll look at is a gymnastic example, and this is an example of a headfirst um, fall incident. So uh, obviously, um, you know, that can be the more serious type of fall incident. And th this just simply shows that this is exactly the same um, technique or response action that a gymnast would use to protect their head and neck if they're coming down head first, and it can happen from time to time. I mean, obviously gymnasts come down on a, on a mat, but these mats aren't crash mats, they're only landing mats. So, you know, they've got some give in them, but they're not that soft. And certainly if uh, uh, you were to land head first, it, it could still be quite catastrophic in that situation. So you can see in this sequence here, the gymnast, and you'll see a video of it, is doing a double somersault uh, in the layout position with a full twist um, and hits his feet on the bar, which is unexpected. Um, so that's not good. He's coming down from a height of around four metres. Uh, and the forces involved end up putting him into a, a very bad position, uh, back arched, head up, uh, arms at the side, uh, and he's coming down head first. And you can see from uh, this slide here on the right that he manages in less than half a second to get his head tucked in and his arms into the brace position. Now you see that with the arms in brace position from that black and white slide down below, uh, that the hands are turned in and the elbows are very slightly bent. And that's because um, that's the position to be in to protect from wrist and elbow injury. If our hands are turned out, there's much more chance of getting a wrist or elbow injury. So he just manages to get his head under and he takes the impact on his shoulder, shoulders. So um, we'll just look at a video because I think it's good to see this at speed. You can see the forces involved. It'll be played twice. So you can see very big force there, but fortunately he's okay because he manages to get his head under. Now, I'm um, going to play it again in slow motion. There's something fairly important to look at, and I'll just stop it in a second if I can. And I want you to look at this, this person here. I'm circling this person who's warming up for his go. I want you to focus on that person there. You see what he does with his arms? Okay. So um, this an important message there. That was just so you can't really see him much. It's quite small. But that gymnast who was observing that event, he wasn't falling off the bar, was he? But in seeing that, that gymnast come down head first, right, he automatically put his arms up into that position. Well, that's his subconscious or unconscious mind working uh, because obviously the unconscious mind says, oh, no, that's 
the head first fall incident and off he goes. So that just tells us the importance that training can we can program our subconscious mind to work for us very quickly in an emergency situation. Okay. Um, right. So we're going to move quickly into just um, looking at some fall scenarios um, and training skills required, fall safety training skills. So uh, firstly, uh, and I'll, I'll show a video of the training exercises to, to help um, train for this scenario uh, a bit later in the presentation. Uh, but obviously one of the worst situations we know is the rotational fall, which can often lead to uh, coming down head first. Um, and look, we can't always, even with the training, you know, we can't always um, you know, necessarily prevent uh, a rider from having a horse come on top of them. But one thing we can do is reduce the risk of that happening. So the training required for a head first fall uh, can be very basic initially, which it is in, in the first scenario, and that's uh, simply um, the brace position, which we've uh, just looked at. Uh, and that can be practiced obviously from training session number one. Uh, and even in training session one, we can do what's called a dive roll drill. That's a simple exercise to learn the body shape or position that you can even see uh, in this uh, position here, upside down. It's a static drill, so it's not hard to do and riders can be trained in that quickly. Standing dive roll, so look, that's a, a, like a mini dive roll, but uh, that has to be done under supervision of a qualified instructor, but it's not a hard skill for riders to learn and you know, obviously with uh, safety matting and so forth. Uh, and then moving into more advanced stuff after around five training sessions and every rider is going to be different so it doesn't necessarily mean all riders will get there in this time but more advanced progression is dive roll from a fast run uh, moving to dive roll over an obstacle um, and that could be a jumps obstacle that would just be programming our unconscious brain to recognize uh, if we're coming down in that scenario and then an exercise that's been designed to simulate uh, falling forwards at speed, which is a bicycle simulation. Um, so that's just the um, training progression, as you can see, to get someone from uh, a position where they might handle themselves poorly, which would be hanging onto the reins uh, and thud onto the ground in an open body position. And I'm sure everyone can see from that slide how that rider is exposed to a much higher risk of catastrophic injury if a horse falls on top of them in that open body position. Whereas the rider who's getting themselves into a tuck position is continuing their momentum. Uh, one is increasing the probability that they can roll clear of a falling horse, maybe not guarantee it, but increase the probability. And furthermore, in a tuck position, uh, anatomically, you're going to fare much better if you've got a 500 kilo horse come on you than if you're in an open uh, body position with uh, abdominal uh, area exposed. So that's the, that one. Our backwards fall, I mean, sometimes, of course, we know we can come off in all kinds of uh, directions. Um, so backwards fall, typically I see on videos, uh, often riders uh, trying to stop themselves or break their fall by putting their arm backwards behind them. Uh, inevitably what happens in those situations is the head still impacts the ground quite hard and thud we, we hit with quite a high uh, amount of force. So uh, not good, whereas one, with a bit of training we can train people to do uh, move into the tuck position with their arms in brace position, as you can see in the bottom sequence there. Uh, and that's a picture of uh, Riley just doing a, a little backward roll on a, a, an incline. Uh, so that takes a bit longer than the forward roll and sideways roll to learn, but certainly uh, benefit in riders practicing that skill. Uh, I'll just quickly show a video of, um, where are we? Oh, okay, this is a gymnast in a backwards fall scenario from a height of, Ooh, I think it would be very close to five metres. So you can see uh, the importance in this situation of arms back. So you saw quite a big force. This one's coming from an even bigger height. Arms back and into a roll sequence. Okay, so he's quite annoyed about the fact that he's missed the bar, but he's perfectly okay. Um, 
So what you can see there is uh, upon, I mean, okay, good that they were feet first landing, but still a lot of force coming into that backwards movement. Uh, had the gymnast just remained open, that would have been a very big force uh, on the head, but instead the forces were dissipated by arms moving back in the brace position, uh, taking a lot of the impact force away from the head and neck and allowing themselves to roll, all right? So uh, people, riders don't need to develop really perfect technique in these skills, but just having a little bit of skill to get the arms into the right position can make a big difference in the impact uh, force. Okay, sideways fall. Um, so this uh, slide shows, of course, uh, um, one thing that happens, I think, probably relatively frequent to riders is coming off sideways. Uh, good thing is the riders letting go of the reins, which is a good thing in this situation because by the look of it, the horse might be falling too. Um, so that's good response action. But often I see in looking at videos this um, situation where, you know, arms go out forwards to try to um, break the fall, but open body position, um, head up, not a good situation if the rider is being flipped or rotated. What you can see in the below diagram is the training to go into what's called a four point landing position. Very basic technique that riders can practice virtually from day one um, and learn how to put themselves into that four point landing position, which is landing arms and legs together. And that's the position we want to be in if we're coming down prone, either forwards or sideways, it doesn't matter. If we're falling prone, uh, we want to be in the, that tuck position, we're breaking our fall with our arms and legs together. And as you can see from um, this sequence here, um, it just is a straight sideways roll, which can be learnt by riders quite easily. But importantly, they've got to have themselves into that position um, as they impact the ground. And again, not much time, but with some training, uh, most riders will be able to get themselves into that position in half to three quarters of a second. Um, prone fall direction, so this is essentially um, the same technique except instead of landing sideways, uh, the rider hasn't been flipped to the point that they're coming down head first, they're coming down prone, uh, but if they weren't travelling at all, okay, they might get away with that, but as you can see from that, if the horse is also coming down, that's a very bad position to be in. And furthermore, if the rider's travelling at speed, uh, they could certainly get flipped in that position, which would expose them to risk of serious spinal injury. Um, whereas uh, with the training to land in four-point landing position, let go of the reins and you see that same position, uh, then the rider's just going to probably get flipped still, but they'll find themselves getting flipped into a roll sequence. So again, it doesn't mean that riders need to be really skilled at these techniques. It's some gross body movements, uh, simple things to get themselves into a position which is going to be more protective than uh, just landing uh, flat. Okay, uh, now let's move on to tumbling at speed. I've already touched upon that, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this slide. Uh, but what we do know from the physics of falling is that uh, uh, Newton's first law of motion tells us that uh, a body at rest will remain at rest or a body in motion will remain in motion unless acted on by a external force. Now, of course, in a high-speed fall incident, that force uh, could come from either hitting the ground and mostly initially it comes from impacting the ground. Um, so what we don't want to do is to try and stop ourselves. Now, for a person who's been untrained in these techniques, I can understand how someone would be very uncomfortable and often will want to go, I don't like this and I want to stop. Uh, but it's actually the worst thing you can do is to try and stop yourself. Well, for two reasons. One is because we want to dissipate uh, those forces over time by rolling. Uh, instead of there being one big impact, we can gradually uh, dissipate the forces uh, over a number of rolls. And secondly, of course, we want to put ourselves in a position where we can put the maximum distance between uh, the rider and the horse, and that is allowing ourselves to roll. Um, we're much more capable of rolling than a horse is. A horse obviously uh, can flip over once or twice, possibly when they hit the ground, but uh, they're not anatomically designed to do multiple roll sequences. Uh, whereas with some training, we can certainly do a multiple roll sequence. I'm going to show you a couple of videos of um, very good, and these riders uh, 
and don't uh, get hurt. Um, so that's a good thing, but it shows you the importance. And the first one is uh, a jump jockey again, uh, who is uh, doing what's called a sideways egg roll. Um, so you see, this is uh, number three, Thubian. So I'll try and point him out. He's on, going to be on the left. Oh, this guy here wearing the red helmet. So just watch what he does as he comes off. So he's traveling. You see how he rolls? He would have rolled about 10 times in that uh, sequence, right? So uh, Richard Eanes, his, his name was, and he was out doing track work the next day. So no, uh, I mean, he might have got a, a, a bruised and a bit of battering, but he was fine to do track work the next day. Uh, so this just shows you the importance of uh, tuck and roll in a high-speed fall incident. So the video I'm showing you now is, is just a, a video of um, learning the egg roll. It's a simple technique. So you can see uh, there on a, a foam mat, so nice and safe. And it's simply just training ourselves to hold ourselves in the brace position and allow ourselves to roll. And this is progressing the skill after a couple of training sessions to doing it on a grass incline. Uh, so we get the feel of uh, doing it with a bit more speed. Um, so again, not difficult for riders to learn that skill. We're teaching, you know, seven, eight, nine year old riders to do that skill in a single training session. Um, so tuck and roll, but it has to be practiced. You know, I can't, uh, stress that often enough that, you know, I can't expect people to do these skills without any training. I mean, some might intuitively do them, uh, but I think everyone can learn those basic skills, which is going to give them better protection than nothing. All right, I'll try and uh, move through so we can allow some time for questions. Um, so skills development, uh, and this shows the sort of skills that will be practiced over around 10 training sessions. Uh, and I will say um, training is individually paced, so obviously that depends on rider fitness levels and aptitude. But what I will say is the basics, which will be things like the brace position, feet first landing, four point landing, forward roll, sideways roll, egg roll, all right? All of those things will give a lot more protection than being untrained, uh, and they can be learned by riders of any age or fitness level, right? They're not difficult skills. Um, and even the dive roll drill, which you'll see in a minute, can be practiced uh, to help minimize or uh, build some muscle memory as to what to do in a head first fall incident without doing any advanced uh, training whatsoever. But I will show you a little bit about how the training progresses uh, to uh, particularly um, that training sequence for head first fall incident. On the right there, you can see uh, a flank vault, which is being learned on a foam vaulting box plus a sideways roll, and that can be, get progressed to a replica horse. So that's training the, the brain to recognise what to do in a fall incident by building a simulation that's going to be as close as possible to a real fall scenario. Okay, so this shows you some fall simulation activities, and we'll look at a, a quick video uh, now of that. First one is the dive roll drill. That's a static position to build the muscle memory of how to come down head first. Uh, the middle one there is Riley just doing a little exercise to release the reins and go into a forward roll. Um, and the bottom right is the bicycle drill, which is an advanced simulation exercise, which would take, you know, for um, most people at least 10 sessions. And it wouldn't necessarily mean that everyone would be doing it if they didn't have the aptitude to do it. But it can be trained safely with the right lead ups. So I'll show you um, a video of the training there. It will be fairly quick. So that's the dive roll drill. So that's just a static position uh, and pushing off into a roll. So that's again building the uh, muscle memory and progressing that from dive roll drill into a, a, a basic standing dive roll, which can be done with assistance initially. Riley doesn't need assistance, but uh, uh, just doing a bit of spotting to show that. So that's onto, onto a soft mat. So, you know, it's uh, uh, easy to train in a safe environment. And you can see how we, we like to combine it with the simulation of letting go of the reins again, just to build that muscle memory. So now progressing the dive roll to coming down from a height. Uh, this happens over a number of training sessions, by the way, not over one session. Uh, and I, I wouldn't recommend um, that. Um, I'd only recommend this be done under supervision of qualified full safety instructor. 
uh, Riley doing the simulation exercise to let go of the reins and fall forward just into a roll. So a basic exercise, but that's training the mind what to do. Uh, this is progressing to um, a dive roll from a run at speed. Uh, not hard to do once people have had the training. You know, pe most people can learn. And now we're adding a little bit of height and speed by adding an airboard. And the next one you'll see is what's called the bicycle simu simulation exercise. Uh, Riley's wearing a, a safety belt there. So that's how we train it without taking any risk of hurting people. And once competent in that bicycle simulation, uh, then it can be done without the safety belt. You can see there he's coming off probably at around 20 kilometres an hour. Uh, and now over a number of training sessions, we've built the speed up and we're going to a slightly firmer landing surface where um, he uh, goes into a multiple roll sequence. Shoe comes off, bit of, uh, <laughs> bit of fun there. <laughs> okay, so, um, oops, go back one. So I hope that gives you a good understanding um, of the um, what's involved. It's only a very brief snapshot. There's obviously a lot more than uh, what you've seen on the videos today. Uh, but just a bit about the training. Um, certainly riders can benefit from a single session, but my recommendation is 10 training sessions because I think over that period of time, uh, all riders should learn the basics so that they're, uh, they can be executed more intuitively in a fall incident. And so, certainly people can be trained to let go of the reins and brace mm -hmm. themselves. Um, it can be done from any location. All we need is a grassed area. Uh, there's a mobile gym set up, so it can go you know, far and wide. I've been, as, been to Adelaide, to uh, Scone, to Bungendore. Uh, certainly uh, Queensland is, is not an issue. Uh, there's a, now a canopy for bad weather, so obviously uh, it's not weather dependent. Uh, and training can be done intensively, and that would probably be for people who are a bit fitter uh, over you know, 10 sessions over two or three weeks. Uh, but... Alternatively, it can be spaced out over time, weekly, fortnightly, monthly, or holiday programs. Um, the recommended training session times are hour for juniors, 8 to 11, um, hour and a half for 12 to 16, and a couple of hours for adults. I mean, there's flexibility there, that's the recommended, but you know, it's not set in concrete. Um, and I'll just uh, finish off before I hand over for any questions. Um, there will be a book coming out, hopefully by the end of next month, the manuscript's just being proofed and edited a few times, where um, these training techniques that I've been talk, uh, talking about tonight have been fully documented, uh, third party reviewed, um, and well tested now with introductory training done for over three, 400 writers. Uh, feedback has been extremely positive, including uh, this one, which uh, Jeremy Bade has kindly uh, allowed to be publicly acknowledged. Uh, Jeremy's a polo player and we were doing uh, introductory training at Windsor Polo Club uh, around Easter and uh, practicing the let go of the reins in the brace position. And seven days later, uh, Jeremy you know, had a high speed uh, fall incident at a flat gallop. Uh, and he indicated that he remembered instantly to uh, let go of the reins and get his arms up. And that enabled him to, I'm assuming it was probably a face or head first fall. Uh, and he ended up in a, um, a roll sequence, uh, landing on his arm, elbow, shoulder, and rolling a couple of times to stand up and walk away. So Jeremy very kindly sent an email to the president of New South Wales Polo, who uh, forwarded it on to me, uh, indicating that he felt that training um, certainly may have helped avoid a catastrophic injury. So great feedback to hear. I'm certainly um, uh, not suggesting that uh, one training session is going to give everyone the skills they need, but it's better than none. Uh, and certainly that does enable people to understand the benefit of the training. And after one training session, I think people start to lose their fear of what the training's about and understand uh, that it can be really helpful. So I think that's part of it is uh, that understanding. Um, so really that's um, 
what I wanted to cover tonight. And I just will reinforce that there are a number of basic skills and drills that can be practiced unsupervised, and those are all all going to be um, outlined in the um, in the book for safety training for horse riders. Um, so they'll be well documented, meaning a number of things that people can do for themselves or you know with their riding instructors, but also other skills that must be learned with qualified supervision. Um, and they, they, the more advanced skills. So um, that'll be out hopefully the end of next month. If you're really interested in, in knowing uh, when it comes out, just drop drop an email to that email address and I'll make sure that you're notified uh, ASAP. But look, thanks. I hope that this um, has been beneficial and I'll just uh, find out if uh, um, there are any question, no questions. Good. Okay, well, uh, thanks again for um, for joining me for, for the session. Um, and uh, I, I believe um, Christine will be sending out some feedback form tomorrow. Um, when one of the questions will be if people are interested in doing some training, um, you have an opportunity to indicate you know, location and possibly a timing that might suit. And uh, it would be fantastic if uh, you know, we started to get uh, some basic training happening for riders or question riders in Queensland. So I'll just hand back over to Christine to uh, finish off. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed that and learnt um, a lot from it. If any of you do think of any questions um, that um, you think of overnight, please feel free to send those through and um, I'll pass them on to Lindsay. Um, thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it.